next, I'm James Beck, by the way. Uh, so for the next five minutes, I'm just gonna, you know, pose a question. Shouldn't we be rethinking debt? And one of the ways of, you know, rethinking debt, in what I've been thinking about over the last couple months, is this idea of SUSUs, or immigrant lending clubs. So, uh, Mr. Patel, and with all due respect, that was an amazing talk. I have to say, over the last year, I've learned a lot about finance. I have a background in history, Chinese politics, but um, it's pretty amazing what's been happening in the DFI space. If you know you had a bag over your head you, and you missed out on DevCon, you realize so much of the excitement is actually understanding what all these products here on the right have been able to show that ETH is a trustworthy foundation and that you know code can be a settlement layer. Um, but this picture here is when I Google Bear Stearns and found some funny clip art. Um, you know, there are some, I think, pertinent parallels to what we actually uh, sort of imagine as the crisis in 2007, 2008. Um, a lot of synthetic derivatives are, you know, over leveraged and it had me thinking a lot about that. So a lot of people probably came to Ethereum thinking about money. And if you haven't read this great book by David Graeber, he sort of poses a question, what makes the concept of debt so strangely powerful? And goes through a history of 5,000 years of different you know, societal conflicts and ways in which debt and the, you know, the breaking of bonds of all the debt that people owe causes war, causes you know, conflict. Um, a couple other interesting things is that uh, even the idea and like built into our language. So in Greek, the word symbolon literally became the word for money. In Chinese, it's fu, and it was literally a word to describe a debt or a credit to someone else. Um, and this symbolon was sort of a, a piece that you break in half and it would represent the debt you owe. Um, so yeah, I mean, debt is very critical to the, our idea of money and I bet if we did a poll, a lot of us in this room have some sort of debt, whether mortgage or student loans or something. Um, so in that, I, I've been thinking about, are there ways that people have been lending and creating money systems that don't involve a debt, or at least some sort of central actor providing a loan or, or some version of credit? Um, and it turns out there are, there's a lot. and. I'm a white American, so this is all new to me, but SUSU is a sort of a West African word, and it describes this idea of a rotating savings and credit association. Turns out it's also a tanda in Latin America, in Chinese it's a kui, and that's been around actually since this guy, since the Tang Dynasty, which was like 600. Um, and what it is is pretty simple. Um, it's the idea of savings with the community, each person puts a set amount into a, a pool, and then the pool rotates. And so you can set the parameters, whether it's, you know, in this example, $10 per week, everyone would receive $200 at some point. Some tandas, in some ways, they set it up where like, people can choose when they want to receive the collective pool. Um, but, so, the other thing though is that it's simply savings, and it's group savings, so no one actually earns interest on the money set aside. So when I was researching this, something I found, um, people all throughout the United States use SUSUs daily. Um, people use it to pay for a car. Um, the Hasidic Jews in Borough Park use it to buy real estate. They, it's just built into the social fabric. They all share their money and essentially one person gets to draw from the pool, from the collective pool. In um, Caribbean communities, it's actually, it happens in church groups. So you have a group of like seven people and one trusted collector, and then eventually, you know, they pay it out, whether it's five months, eight months, what have you. Um, and then this quote is that a lot of people who are on banks, especially in the US, uh, form these informal uh, lending clubs. So, yeah, in like the early 2000s, banks obviously are like, you know, thinking, okay, how can we profit and scheme on this? So, um, there's actually this, this project that Barclays is still doing with GCSCA, which 
they selected a actual individual that, that they call a susu collector. And in these Ghanaian markets, people in roadside stalls, they've already been using these susu schemes, pooling resources to be able to buy large shipments of you know, produce. Um, and what they found is that there's actually you know, 75, 75 million pounds um, being traded and collected. So there's some drawbacks. Um, if there is a central collector, even if it's a small group of people you trust, there's a chance they go off the grid, they take all the money and run. Um, the other idea is that you know the person who is last in line to get it does not receive any interest, so it's a little less reliable than putting money in a bank account, and that's assuming you know you have enough money to create a bank account. Um, so the last thing I'm going to raise is along doing this research, there was like, like two projects that came up, just you know sort of this testament to how fast things are moving in the DeFi space. But pulled together, I've been using that. Um, it's more of, they're describing themselves as a no loss lottery. Um, and it's kind of fun and they're earning interest on the side. There's also Acropolis. Um, I'm not exactly sure the status of this project, but in their website materials they describe it as these informal lending clubs. Um, so I guess, yeah, um, this is sort of a call to continue talking with other people if you want to discuss SUSUs and think about the applications for Ethereum with, I guess, trustless SUSU collectors. Thank you.